Welcome to the Write the Dogs podcast. Actually, that just sounded like I said Write the Dogs, so maybe I should Wolf. be a little bit more enunciating. <laughs> <laughs> write the Dogs podcast, episode number 20. Uh, how is everybody? Let's, let's, as always, start in the future. How are you doing, Jared? Oh, look, I'm doing okay. I've been battling a cold for about a month, but I think I've turned the corner, so I'm happy about that. And work-wise, uh, all the things at the moment. <laughs> all the things. <laughs> Okay, let's let's flip back. I think into the distant past, as far as I'm concerned. Tom, how are you doing? Tom is Tom, muted. You're, you're, Tom is <laughs> muted. Sorry, I was going to say it is still twenty uh, twenty like seventeen here, so we're still kind of <laughs> creeping into the future. We're curious what it what it holds. No, things are going well. I have a daughter who is who is like applying to college, so I'm going through that whole process, and that's quite an exciting time. Uh, but other than that, uh, you know, California is looking great here. All right. Coming forward slightly, Matt, I do believe you are in New York. We'll get on to who you are and what you do in a bit more detail in a minute. But how are you doing over in New York, if I'm correct? Uh, well, I'm good. I, I, normally, I would be in New York, but I'm actually visiting the main office here ah. in Stuttgart, Germany. So I don't think that we are very far from each other right now. No, I am up north in um, uh, Das Hauptstadt, Der Hauptstadt of, of Germany in Berlin. Um, I was confused as to why a guy in New York was working for a GmbH, but uh, we can maybe cover that in a minute. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but uh, and that also explains why you were looking for rooms. You're in the in the mothership, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, and uh, yeah, Berlin is dark. It was, it's been very warm, and then it suddenly went back to being winter, although not as winterful as it could be. Climate change, eh? Anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Um, so here we are, episode number 20, with Matt. Uh, actually, I just realized I should know better living in Germany. I also mispronounced your name. It's Matt Reiner. Yeah, I yeah. I need yeah. me on the wrong way. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, you're down in Stuttgart at the moment working for, maybe tell us a bit about the company you are currently working for and what they do, and then we'll start digging into some, some of the reasons we have you on the show. Yeah, so uh, I work for a company called K15T, uh, and we make a, a couple of different apps for Confluence um, to enable teams to do real tech rating in Confluence. Um, I think... Jared said it well. Um, there's some things about Confluence that look very confluency, and that doesn't jive well when you're trying to write together and publish things in a professional way. And so we have a couple of different apps on the marketplace um, for content management. Uh, and my team specifically works on those that enable technical writing. Okay. And yeah. and what what were you doing before that? What's your background? Yeah, so that's that's kind of a funny story. So, um, I mean, I've had a lot of different jobs, worn a lot of different hats, uh, but my last one was a, tech, a technical writer, uh, and I actually worked for a company. We made a software as a service product, and I was looking for a way to quickly document it. And so, I actually stumbled upon K15T's apps and started using those apps, and uh, eventually. Uh, came here to Stuttgart and spoke at a, a TC World Conference about how we were using things and um, our relationship grew and I ended up joining the team directly uh, to, to see how my expertise as a tech writer could be beneficial to the team as we build the apps for this very specific use case. Actually, just very quickly looking back through your CV, it looks slightly familiar. Nimble, Nimble user, that, what do they make? That seems vaguely familiar as a company. <laughs> uh, we made, uh, or they still make, um, Nimble AMS, which is a, um, it's built on top of the Salesforce CRM, and it's specifically for uh, managing associations. So they have very unique needs uh, on top of just typical CRM needs. So uh, we were, you know, it's pretty massive application on top. I don't know why it seems familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't used it. Uh, okay. But, um, it seems like you come from a very enterprise-y background, also seeing Level 3, which is now CenturyLink, which I think is a pretty big company. That definitely sounds familiar, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which I guess is what took you into the Atlassian world, but we'll I'll cast no judgment. <laughs> 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 uh, 
people know I'm much more of an open source person. So, um, all right, enough enough background. Um, let's dig into our first topic. I think this is with you, Jared, if you'd like to introduce what it was you wanted to bring up first. Yes, that's right. So I um, had a challenge over the last couple of weeks, which I've put on the back burner until this episode, because um, I've got to think of a way that um, I can make workflows that would help developers meet like a minimum standard or a minimum team standard for documentation. And I figured that there's, uh, I could, I have some ideas about it myself, but it's probably a lot better to use the Write the Docs Hive Mind um, to talk about because there's a lot of experience out there um, in this. And I'm sure we've had this, the challenge ourselves where, you know, we need to help our developer friends um, write documentation that, you know, is useful, is well structured. And uh, a lot of the time, developers can have problems just making a start. So I want to help them with that. But at the same time, I want to um, I want to review their work for them and help them with um, editing and stuff. But at the same time, I don't want to be the editor, if you know what I mean. So um, I want to work out ways of getting that minimum standard before it hits my desk so that my time is best utilized because uh, technical writers well know that, you know, our time is strictly limited. So um, making sure we use it properly is really important as well and make it so that the team understands that is also really important too. So, yeah, I'm really interested to see, um, you know, some ideas from you folks about what you think about it. So as a background um, in my team specifically, some members don't really have an affinity for documentation um, at all. They know it needs to be done, but they don't really know how to do it right. Or they, in some cases, they just don't want to do it right. Um, they're also non-native speakers, some of them. So they've already come to me and, and said, look, you know, I, I really do struggle sometimes when I have to write documentation. Is there anything I can do to make that easier? Um, th some folks just don't really know how to start. They're not bad at documentation, but just making that first initial leap is really hard for them. And um, nearly all of them don't use any form of grammar linter. So they don't use Grammarly. They don't use any sort of code based linters. So there's a few things there that I think we can probably unpack as we we explore different ways of um, of uh, of helping these folks get started. Okay, Tom, I saw you briefly grinning very broadly what? in the middle of that. We, so do you have no, something because, you want to add there? <laughs> no, just because Jared Jared said, and they don't want to, they don't really want to write documentation, or they don't like doing it. I assume these are engineer types. Is that right? Or is yeah, this just... in this particular case, they are um they're DevOps guys. Yeah. 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 I, I I have some thoughts on this. I mean, um, to give this a larger context, I think you hit upon an issue that is very, uh, it cuts across many different levels. When people try to hire technical writers and they look at writing samples, they have the same question. How do I, how do I judge whether this is good or not? You're trying to apply standards to say your, your writing has to be this level of good at least. And therefore, it must have X, Y, Z characteristics. And I think in general, people struggle with this because they don't know how to they don't know what those characteristics are. So how do you assess good writing from bad writing? Um, this is why in, in a lot of job ads, like the writing part isn't as emphasized because people don't really know, like what constitutes good writing. And I mean, ideally, uh, in order to evaluate writing and say, yes, this is good, you kind of need to be a user, right? You kind of need to go through the, the the instructions. It's kind of like if you had an Ikea manual and you said, well, it looks nice, but you don't know if it's going to be good or not until you actually assemble the thing. And then you're like, oh, this step is complete trash. You know, I got lost in 17 places. But but you don't have time to do that if you're editing and you're kind of the, you're the gatekeeper on lots of docs coming through. So I think... Um, and also, uh, there are different levels. You're trying to find a minimum. So I would say that, that you, you would start to look for basic best practices for design, where things have structured subheadings or you know subheadings that have structured the information somewhat. You've got numbered lists that things uh, are chunked appropriately. They're not like, you know, it's it's the right like size. Like a big wall that, of text. Yeah, and and that that 
the the copy has characteristics of plain language where the sentences are somewhat short it's not full of jargon or if it is it's defined There's some basic characteristics and you you could have all that and it could still be terrible right it could still be like completely inaccurate but you wouldn't really know that until you maybe did some user testing but that's another level that you could start to ratchet that up chris or, or matt did you have any thoughts on on this question I do. I'm going to let Matt go first. Though. <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, I was, I was going to say, Jared, how old is the product that the team works on? So or this team, this team, well, because they're DevOps guys, they're running documentation both for our team internally for, for their future selves. So they can work yeah. out how to do things, but they're also writing documentation for other teams to actually interact with the DevOps parts of the business. So it, it's pretty that there are some products in the business that are old, but a lot of the the DevOps infrastructure that they're um, maintaining and supporting is pretty new. Uh, we're actually implementing Kubernetes at the moment, for example. Um, okay. So a lot of this documentation is new frontier stuff for them, and um, the good thing is our product owner is is very particular about documentation, which is a great advantage. And um, for that reason, he really wants them to understand, like from now, like if they don't get the documentation right, he understands that it's going to cause problems down the track because people won't be able to follow it. They're going to, all the work they've done in the sprints preparing the Kubernetes features, for example, won't be backed up with good documentation, which means that people won't be able to follow it and so on and so on. Yeah, I, geez, a product a product owner who feels that strongly about documentation, that's a rare find. Very rare and very yeah. rare. <laughs> Most teams that I've been in that realize, hey, the docs are important and we should help, are those that are working with a code base that's old enough where they can't remember where things started. Uh, and, you know, shoot, what did that thing do? I don't remember. Look at the docs. Oh shoot, we didn't. You know, we didn't document it. If you can start the process with, you know, having in mind that you need to be kind to your future selves, that's half. You know, that's half the battle. Um, you know, it, it. I think it's more of, or it's almost as much of an attitude by the team as it is, um, you know, a, a, an actual practice of writing. The other thing I would say is, you know, depending on the relationships you have with the team. Um, I found a great way to bring developers into writing, right? Because you'll hear designers say, hey, everyone should be a designer. And you'll, see, you'll hear developers say, hey, everyone should be a coder. And testers will say everyone should be a tester and so on. Uh, but really, everyone should be a writer. Everyone should be a good writer. Um, and there is no software project from open source to uh, you know, uh, big paid app where documentation in the code or outside of the code is not an issue. Um, you know, writing is just such a fundamental thing. Um, a great way to guide people into that is if you can take on sort of the reviewer role and not as a, uh, you know, I'm going to slap you if you, you know, f screw up that semicolon, but more of a, hey, let's collaborate. You do draft one, I'll do draft two um, with a very light style guide, um, one that is helpful, not uh, uh, discouraging. I guess that that has been my experience, but that's not to say that um, it's going to happen overnight. I, I think I'm mostly going to go along with you there. Have I, I sort of split my time between open source projects where, I mean, it's somewhat hard to encourage every contributor to conform to things because the fact they're even committing in their spare time is is already a great thing. You don't want to put them off too much. Um, and then internal on some either open source on or closed source SaaS products. Um, I guess we've generally come across needing some sort of minimum standard, usually through problems. Um, I think the biggest problem I've generally found is there's just nothing. <laughs> there is no minimum standard because there's absolutely nothing. A feature isn't documented at all. Uh, and that's usually when someone in the company, an engineering manager or a product manager says, oh, we need to actually start like having a, a checkbox that a feature isn't released until there's docs. Um, like we just, with one company, we just had a huge major release 
I read the release notes and I was like, oh, there's a whole bunch of features I have no idea existed here. <laughs> and there were no docs for them. So um, that was kind of a bit of a wake up call for everybody, which was good, actually. I could see looking ahead in the doc, I could see Jared added a few questions for things like uh, templates, which I think would be good to get to in a minute, because that's actually something I'm guilty of never having really done. Uh, I'm not even in, I'm also not entirely sure where I would start actually because it very much depends on the on the feature and on the product we did it did actually just work with a, a SaaS client where we did make a template for certain sections of their documentation like um, getting started with a particular SDK for the product guides but then already we hit problems with templates because some of the SDK supported some features and some didn't support other features. And at a certain point, the templates became kind of too arduous for the developer, actually. Um, so, yeah, I think when I look down this, this list of things you could do, I obviously work across different projects and some are further developed on this than others. Um, in fact, usually the product companies because that's their their bread and butter business, of course, because the open source projects, that's more if they just get enough GitHub issues of people complaining about something that it, it comes up. Um, yeah, so actually, Jared, I'd like to loop back to you, seeing as this is your topic. Have you looked at templates yet? And if so, what have you been thinking? Yeah, so we, we already do have the, the whole idea of, of templates. I've certainly set up a, a number of them um in confluence when i when i started and even in code the guys have actually um been working on because it's basically all men in the team so the guys have all been working on developing their own templates for the kubernetes server roles and that's meant that every time they go and and instantiate a new uh, server role, they just fill in the blanks in this documentation. So that sort of way of thinking is already part of the, the team's uh, mentality, which is a big, big um, win. Um, but it comes to the, the sort of documentation that goes outside of the, the strictly sort of um, server role stuff, which has a very clearly defined structure. I mean, you know, when you're setting up server roles, you you need to know things like, you know, where the DNS records go. And that's always a, a subheading that you can always template. Um, but when we go outside of that more structured sort of documentation to document something like servers, that's when it starts getting a bit tricky. And I'm I know that it's hard to write templates that cover all bases because generally the template is massive <laughs> if you do that and it actually becomes unusable. But I'm just wondering if there's, if you were wanting to tell a team what would be the, the top three or top five things um, in a, a template that you always need to have, what would those things be? And I think one of them that I that my product manager always um, talks about is the overview section, right? Why am I reading this a document? Because sometimes you get, have you ever got through a document halfway through and gone, I don't know why I'm reading this, <laughs> you know? So that sort of thing is what I'm interested yeah. in. I think a why is definitely always, usually an essential. I don't know. <laughs> I can't think of an instance where why is not essential. <laughs> I was just reading an article actually that that kind of paints two common behaviors of of users, and this is uh, some people who are looking at API docs, and they paint one camp as a, kind of a top down person who starts with the why, who starts with the conceptual, and then moves down to more of the details. They call these systematic users, but the opposite behavior, somebody who starts in a code sample tries to make it work, copies and paste, and then kind of backs out further and further to the concepts. They call these opportunistic developers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a, a good a good documentation, good documentation would have both that conceptual why, as well as some kind of detailed code sample for uh, more developer docs. And maybe, maybe a code sample is not appropriate in, in your genre, but something more that would align with the kind of opportunistic, but but you definitely need both. You know, if, if you have a code sample, you'd want comments or something um, for the people who are going to skip that that 
conceptual explanation. I, I, I wish there were like very specific things that you could always do, uh, to make, to make a template kind of foolproof. But the, the reality is that it only works in highly structured specification docs, like open API specifications or Java docs or something where there are clear tags that they have to fill out and developers really do appreciate that. I mean, I appreciate that kind of stuff, but, but more open-ended stuff, um, People have done studies to try to identify what are the core patterns of our discourse. And uh, um, let me just refresh my notes here, but I actually have a whole essay on this, uh, you know, conforming to the patterns and expectations of the genre. What are those expectations? Well, you have some kind of goal um, that our user is trying to do that you're describing. You have prerequisite states. What, are you, what do you have to have in place? You have an action and a reaction, do this, this happens. Then you have an unwanted state section where you have like troubleshooting. And, you know, people looked at, let's see, this is a, uh, this dates back 20 years when people are trying to pin down what are the components of documentation that are your, that are essential, what makes up a procedure. Um, and, and yeah, they, they identify those four or five different components. Um, Problem is, it seemed kind of very basic. You know, yeah, you can have an overview and a prerequisites and a task and a and a troubleshooting and maybe even an FAQ at the bottom for miscellaneous whatever else. Um, is that going to lead to great docs? Yeah, actually, might might not be a bad start. I mean, at least gives them a, a pattern that then then they can deviate from rather than a, just a blank page. Yeah, I think you might have hit on it then. Because you know it's it's giving them in the case of the the folks in the team who who have trouble just starting to write, I think that is really helpful having something like even a template and in particular like if you're doing this in Confluence you can put the helper tests in, um, which helps. Or in a Markdown file you can just comment and put like what do I expect in this section, what sort of things go into it, and that will actually help them understand right what they what they need to put into that section. This is actually one of the one of the good things about DITA, the the Darwin Information Typing Architecture uh, model, is that even though I'm not a proponent of this model, um, when you start to write according to the different elements, it sort of guides you along a path. You say, "Oh, you know, I need a title. Now I need a short description of something, and now I've got a task that has these elements, and it kind of gives you a map." Um, but then very quickly you realize that like. Hey, uh, I don't really want to follow this exactly, and now I want to do something different. It's not letting me. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, so you could have them write according to that structure. And in a lot of large documentation groups, they were they often do implement DITA because how do you wrangle all these different people who might have contrasting styles? And one person wants to do things one way, another has a different style. It's a way of standardizing and kind of simplifying saying, look, this is a uh, good docs. You, you have a task and it has numbered steps that have actions and, and results, you know, that's, and you have prerequisite sections and you have summaries at the top. And if you at least do these things, it's going to look like, like help. It's going to follow these basic components of our genre and, and discourse. Um, yeah. I'd like to, uh, Matt, uh, take, taking off your, K15T hat, just for a second. <laughs> is, um, I've not ever, <clears throat> sorry, I've not ever really um, used Confluence for documentation. Is, does it or any of the tools you know of <laughs> help you with this kind of structure in, in some way, in a, in a similar way of helping people get started and fill out gaps in any kind of method? <sighs> So my, my Confluence hat is always, and my K15T hat is always loosely on because I'm always trying on different ones. Um, I think this goes, so I'll talk about the problem and then how I think it could be solved in Confluence, but other tools as well. I feel like getting started writing is a very painful thing. I think those of us who have been writing for a while, we don't recognize that pain as much, but to many staring at a blank page is like standing in front of an audience to give a speech. I mean, it's just 
when you're not in practice, it's a very intimidating thing. So something, uh, you know, some form of template, even if we can't anticipate every need, um, just to say, hey, you know, a short description is incredibly valuable to explain why someone is interested in this, right? Um, another thing that would be helpful, I think, is to direct people to, um, you know, especially for a concept topic, I feel like a lot, you know, concept topics are really where it gets difficult because they are so freeform, right? And those are also some of the most important documents because it does kind of, it tells you why and overall, how does this work, right? Those sorts of things, um, you know, recommend that they start listing off what are the things that you think people want to do? What do you want to do? Do this, do this, do this, do this, and then use those statements as headings and then develop your content from there. Um, that's actually a trick. <laughs> so in my new role, I'm, I'm writing some marketing materials, right? Um, I know there's different feelings on marketing writing, um, but this is, uh, <laughs> this is on the, on the uh, light side of the force, so to speak. Um, but one of the things that my colleagues keep telling me is people need to be able to skim your content, right? And your headings, that's where that happens. Um, and, and, you know, if you talk with anyone on your team, um, the same is true for technical documentation, right? The, the people who are going to be skimming this documentation, they want good headings too. So that's a sort of a way that I've seen to steer even someone who doesn't call themselves a writer to at least say, these are the things that need to be done. And then we'll work on describing that later. Um, so in Confluence specifically, um, there are templates within Confluence. And one of the things I like about their approach to templating, um, kind of like what Tom said, rather than taking the very strict approach that did it takes, which is great in you know very uh, very um, structured documentation that has the exact same structure for three thousand documents, um, you create what's called instructional text. So instructional text, you as the author of the template can can guide people. Um, but they ultimately sort of decide what they're going to do. And that's where you can put in things like, hey, make a list of all the problems that people need to solve and then you know, begin describing those, those sorts of things. But you don't need Confluence to do that, right? There's many different approaches. You could have you know, a collection of Word documents that have those templates in them. It's really, I, I think it's, it's, how, it's what you provide your team to begin that writing process. And, and that, I think it's important it's easy for me to forget how difficult it is to start writing, mm -hmm. um, even for myself. <laughs> I'd actually like to, um, I, I keep channeling this book because I really liked it. And it's, it's nothing to do with technical writing per se. In fact, he's a little critical of technical writers. Um, uh, Stephen King's on writing book. Um, one of the things I liked most about it was that he blew away a lot of the whether you like his stuff or not, he's a successful writer and very prolific. Um, he blew away a lot of the kind of mystique around things. Um, and I guess channeling his concept of a template is to sort of start with an idea and just keep going and then come back later, um, which again sounds a lot easier. <laughs> so then, then maybe it is in reality. But um, yeah, it, it sort of reminded me a little bit of it. I'm not sure if... The, t the time is 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 blurring my vision here because uh, maybe now I'm saying it doesn't really make sense, but it made sense in my head when I thought of it. Um, wrapping up this subject, I'd like to to kind of get to the 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 end of this. We have templates, we have uh, uh, encouragement to get people started. Um, if you are lucky enough, I'm going to have to caveat this because I think a lot of people listening and watching here will be thinking even having developers even do anything that you have to review would be fantastic because um, usually you're just doing it yourself. But if you are in that fortunate situation, um, what would you consider kind of the minimum worth you considering, I guess? Um, yeah. Jared, why don't you kick that off again? Like what would you like okay. to see before you get involved? Yeah, I think there's it's so easy to get access to Grammarlinters these days. I mean, look at Grammarly, for example. Um, I actually 
<laughs> despite Tom's advice, I actually did go and get a premium subscription to that the other day. And it, it is useful specifically in marketing writing, which I think we might be touching on next um, in the way it, it evaluates your language. But even for most technical uh, writing as well, you can at least get rid of like 80% of the misspellings or grammar constructs. And, and that's really useful, I think, for people who perhaps aren't um, native speakers. So I think my my minimum baseline would be everyone has run it through Grammarly free, even if they don't have access to Grammarly Premium or another linter. If they've got a linter set up that um, evaluates text and you know, it does it on check-in with their code, great, that's excellent. Um, because there's nothing more challenging than wanting to help someone out with their document, but the first three or four sentences is just riddled with grammatical errors and you just can't see past the trees. You know, you, you want to help with the structure and the content, but it's just too many grammatical errors and you just can't see past them. Mm. Yeah. Tom. Hey, hey, uh, just to comment on the Grammarly thing, <laughs> I I do like Grammarly. I used it to edit <laughs> my entire API doc course that has over like 500 pages printed out. I, it took me weeks and I found a ton of useful, you know, suggestions. The reason I said it's problematic is that uh, their, their privacy doesn't meet the security standards of most like corporations. Uh, and so it's completely blocked at my company and a lot of other companies. And I don't see any way that our security department would ever agree to their uh, unrestricted royalty free kind of licensing of content on their servers um, that, you know, I'm not even allowed to put on a USB drive or something. Right. So, yeah, fair enough. Other than that, I think it. premium subscription but it's it's a great product sorry i just had to clarify that a little bit because it made it sound like i was like coming out against it i i do like it and wish i could you know leverage it more fully in the work and, and other options are available for those of you in uh security restricted environments but yeah. there's uh, a lot of ones that's a whole yeah, other we, conversation yeah. um yeah Matt, just uh, just briefly what, what 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 would you like to see or what would you encourage people to to pass by you first? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to have to go with the grammar linter, really important. <laughs> but one thing that might be successful is if you work with a few key members of the team to, to really nail just a few documents and then use those as examples for the team and say, hey, I'd like, you know, this is sort of our expectation. And here are some examples from your colleagues. And what that does is it gives you great buy-in, automatic buy-in from the team. And those people that wrote those documents, you know, there's a, sort of a sense of pride with it and also a sense of, hey, you know, I created these, you can create them too. Mm -hmm. um, so along with the fact that no one likes to have you know, their grammar nitpicked, definitely building that sense of internal buy-in and pride around the docs. Uh, it, I, it's difficult at first because you do have to do that nitpicking, but then once you have them, it's sort of like, uh, you know, having your um, key issues you use when you assign story points to tickets in the agile process, you have that guideline and then um, everyone can kind of stick to it. I think I'm going to go, my minimum standard is going to actually be something slightly different. Mostly this is dictated a little by the fact that I mostly work on open source projects and that I also mostly work with non-native English speakers, and that I don't actually want to nitpick too much on grammar. Some of the people I work with do pick up on things I've said and slowly improve it. Um, but actually, for me, I think I would rather have something that is as complete functional explanation, as far as I can tell, uh, and with code examples that work, uh, and not from the perspective of this is a developer who's got a machine set up perfectly um, so of course it works on my machine, but actually on the machine of someone who's never touched it before. And then the grammar and stuff like that, I'm happy to, to, uh, to figure out, to be honest with you. That's kind of my minimum, actually. It's slightly around the other way, but I think that's dictated by the fields I work in. Um, hey, I have a, uh, Chris, going along with this, I kind of have a fun survey question that I've been um, uh, posing to engineers. I'm just kind of curious what, what you would say with this. Um, 
but it goes in this same vein of overemphasizing grammar or under. Question is, when I read documentation, this is for engineering people. When I read documentation myself, I would rather read content written by an engineer rather than a tech writer, even if it's written poorly. What would you say the percentage of agreement is among engineers on that? Well, yeah, uh, most of the ones that I've spoken to generally do agree with that, that they don't really care how well it's written. But, but I would argue that the fact is the vast majority of documentation out there is written by engineers, so they don't always know um, the difference per se to begin with. And I would also say that a lot of the things that we tend to talk about as tech writers, it's like that the engineering paradigm might be code that works versus code that's um, beautiful. I can't think of a better word, but, you know, like efficient and works really well, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the same paradigm can be drawn in that code that's written averagely, sorry, documentation that's written averagely, but gets you there is fine. But then when you have something that has that extra polish, you know, tweaking the grammar, all that kind of thing, makes enough difference that you do notice it when you come across it but it's sometimes hard to convince engineers that that does make a difference that's <laughs> that's the main argument i have most of the time i i think that the responses so far uh, have kind of been split which is what i'm getting from your answer about 35 percent agree or strongly agree and about 35 percent disagree or strongly disagree and then like 22 percent are neutral so that's yeah. i thought they would all say yeah we don't care about you know tech writer polish and whatever but no i mean a lot of people and maybe the question is bad in itself but i just I guess thought it, it depends be on the product again as well yeah, yeah. yeah so many, i was uh, gonna say mm -hmm. an api i mean if you're dealing with an api where a word in the description of the documentation makes uh, you know a big difference that that's a big difference <laughs> true yeah that, yeah I, that sounds my, like a good slogan to me so i think this is a good uh, a good segue into, <laughs> into topic number topic. 2 which has your name next to it matt so what is this topic yeah so this is the topic that so here's here's the deal in my in my new role I not only do some product work and some technical writing, but also I'm doing marketing writing or marketing copy. Um, and this is sort of new for me. I, I've done some marketing writing in the past, um, but more in the form of, you know, just blog posts and things. Hmm. Um, and one of the things that I think I certainly have in my head and I'd love to, I want to hear other people's thoughts is that marketing writing, well, technical writing seems to be, um, we'll write it as long as it needs to be, as long as it's technically accurate. And marketing writing sort of flips that on its head and it says, we're going to make it very flashy, very short, and perhaps we may even twist the truth just a little bit to add that extra pizzazz. I, I don't know. Um, but I am not convinced there needs to be so much of a difference there. And, and the nice thing about the company that I'm working for right now is, you know, they told me day one, we don't write clickbait. We don't write sensational things. We write the truth where, you know, we create technical writing solutions. So we want to make sure they are exact and truthful and properly written. So, you know, I've never, I don't think I've ever had as many people review my writing as I do now, which is sort of sad because I've been a tech writer for several years now. So, so what are your thoughts on the difference between the, two, you know, the two styles of writing and are there better ways we can sort of take the best of both world and, and work together across technical writing and marketing groups? I, I have some thoughts on that. I don't know if you if somebody else wants to go first, but so I I think that um, I guess frankly I get really frustrated about marketing writing uh, because in all my experience, marketers refuse to engage in transparent and open ways about topics that really matter to users. Uh, they will never say anything negative about a product pretty much always like I've never met a marketer who has allowed 
any kind of <laughs> any kind of transparency about some shortcoming or limitation or frustration that users have had. And that drives me absolutely nuts. As a result, I'm persuaded 100% that marketing has very little credibility with users, like especially blog posts for marketers. Uh, and so the only strategy for success is to focus marketing on topics that are like tech tutorials or like announcements or release news and things like that that aren't really aren't um more issue focused but try to get a marketer to talk about an actual issue that users have they won't do it like at least i've never met them sorry that sounds kind of negative huh no i think <laughs> good, to, good. Uh, yeah i I, I have done some similar stuff to Matt, actually. I have not done, I, I mean, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by marketing writing because I have done some and it tends to be the tech marketing. And most of the companies I've worked for where I have done some what I would consider tech marketing work, tech blogs, um, maybe some white papers, things like that. It's been for a developer-focused product anyway. So you have to have a level of technical detail and it's fairly well known from tech marketers that developers can smell a rat pretty quickly. So it's actually usually good to not obfuscate the truth too much because it will be found out um, quite quickly and probably plastered all over Reddit or something. So, so um, and I think actually I agree with a lot of what you've said in your topic. You, you put a title, which I quite like, Can Tech Writers Help Marketing? For the question. And I'd like to caveat that by saying, can tech writers help marketing and vice versa? Um, actually, in a new company I have been doing some work for, which is a proprietary SaaS product, um, the tech writing team, which is consists of me and someone else working a day a week, <laughs> so put team in quote marks, uh, have actually been speaking to the marketing team and proposing style guides and things to the marketing team. So it depends very much on the company, of course. Um, but yeah, I have, I will definitely say I have always worked in uh, tech focused products where even the marketing team has an eye on the, the level of technical content in the language. So it's a little biased, I think. Uh, hey, hey, just to go along with something you're saying, Chris. Um, so they did a, at my work, they did a kind of AB testing of emails, email campaigns sent out in a flashy template with like lots of graphics and kind of pizzazz and then like a plain text newsletter which do you think got more clicks well i would guess that the plain text <laughs> one was harder to track the clicks but it probably still got more <laughs> yeah the plane got more it got more yeah. like hands down they did this multiple yeah. times because well, as you say <laughs> um, especially you get developers that they're turned off by kind of the marketing yeah. flair and they want something more i don't know information unbiased objective and yeah i guess so. developers deal in text they want to read this text they don't want to have all the styles surrounding it um yeah. <laughs> i know you've <laughs> been <Sorry>. developing jared <laughs> you've been developing email templates for the last yeah. two weeks or three weeks or months yeah or something. tried two Talk months yeah tried two months <laughs> yeah so this has been very interesting uh the, the first sort of bit of real uh, external facing Marcoms that um, the company I'm working for has done. So that's involved like selecting the tooling, working out whether that tooling that we, we've we got is suitable for it. Um, also looking at the, the template um, design, which by far has taken the longest amount of time to get right. Uh, and we're talking about not just text like templates here, we're talking about full design templates, working out the the, the sort of brand sort of persona that we want to like convey in the first um, mail out. It's been a really long process. And like when I entered into it, we were sort of planning this out over one sprint, which is three weeks for us. And it's gone over two. Um, so it's taken a lot longer than I would have thought. And I think it's interesting about the whole text versus styled um, communication um, because that's, I mean, that's certainly where most of the effort's gone, I think, in this case. Um, I would have had three rounds um, on the content. Initially, I was writing it like a blog post, so more narrative style. Um, but 
um, when we submitted this to the stakeholder, um, the stakeholder said, no, it's, it's way too long. We need to cut it down like by about, oh, geez, more than a third or, or more than like two quarters or two lots. <laughs> we need to cut it down lots. So you then had to completely reframe the text and try and condense it into like a essentially a Twitter summary. Um, and that was really hard. Um, so I think the biggest thing I would suggest is that the way technical writers can help is to help the business identify a company persona and help them define the language that they want to use consistently to convey the, the Marcom's message that they're sending out um, and put some do's and don'ts in. Like, so, um, you know, do use um, friendly tone, but don't use corporate stuffy tone for example, in, in the style um, guide, because it's that's what I'm going to be doing after this is all done and dusted. I'm going to be making a quick reference, essentially, for me, my future self, when we need to do another one of these. Matt, I, I um, found that... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I was going to ask... I was going to pose Matt another question, so carry on first. And then we'll... I was just going to make the point that it, additionally, uh, tech writers can help marketers by just um, being aware of all the, the stuff that's coming out. We tend to be a lot closer to engineering and, and what's being released and the, the nitty gritty details, whereas marketers are sometimes even unaware or at a high level, they don't know. And so there's that, that sense of, of information we can provide. One of the questions that you, sub questions you put in this question, Matt, was around I guess that whole, I think this is always the ideal of so many companies, but always so hard to realize this sort of unified voice, this, this unified kind of way of talking and presenting across every communication that I don't know if any company ever accomplishes this, but um, so I guess the first question with your, with your new role, were you the first person to do all this? So have you had the opportunity to, to try this or were you kind of taking on a legacy that you had to shape or how have you, how have you found it so far? Oh, that is a hard question. So I've, I've actually, from my last gig, um, I had, a, you know, pretty much a pure technical writing focus. Um, and we had a separate marketing team. No, it, was a, it was a smaller company, maybe 60 people. So, you know, it's certainly not, you know, I'm not talking about a large organization, but I really got turned on to, um, what I think some are calling information experience or IX. Um, and it's pushed pretty hard by um, Dan Stevens, who's a really, really cool guy. He's a uh, tech writer on the Bitbucket team uh, at Atlassian. And they, what, what they ended up doing was um, the Bitbucket team, uh, they have docs for that. And they felt like the, the marketing team was coming up with sort of almost duplicates of the same content, right? They were coming up with uh, like tutorials. Um, and, and so rather than letting that go on and sitting in the tech writing office and complaining about the marketing team, um, they sort of bridged the gap and they said, hey, how about you let us write the, the, the tutorials? We talk about keywords and you know, what are our, our major focuses? And then we'll write our own copy and then we'll link it up properly. And one of the things that they even did was they created, you know, the whole campaign in their marketing software. It tracked the journey through the marketing materials into the tutorials to make sure, you know, that people were not just learning about the marketing, but actually pushing through into the tutorials and eventually, you know, uh, probably downloading Bitbucket or something like that. And that case study came back as a really big positive within the company. And they've actually created a whole group that does that now. Um, so in my small company, I'm like, yes, I'm going to do this. And um, I started talking with the marketing group about style guides and um, consistent messaging and all this stuff. Um, and then we were acquired and you know, every, everything went to hell. But before that, uh, things were heading in a positive direction. So in my new role, we actually have self-organized teams. So within each team, uh, we own a few of the apps that my company makes and we within the team have to handle development and marketing and support and everything. And so that has really, that's really changed the dynamic because everyone on the team understands 
we need to do some marketing for this release we're working on. Um, even the engineers, which has been a, a big shift for me because there is um, sort of a shared interest in the team that we're successful with our marketing, um, as opposed to you know my last gig where it was like, oh yeah, marketing is a thing, they do stuff. Um, so that has helped with that shared vision, but I'm but the the difficulty now is we have multiple self-organized teams. So across those teams, we need to then have a share, you know, a shared voice. So yeah. it helps unify <laughs> tech writing and marketing within a team, but we have to do it you know, on a broader scale. So there still needs to be some kind of you know style guides that we're following, um, which is difficult to do. Tom, working in the in the the belly of a very 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 large company, which I'm sure has a very very large marketing team, um, and I've definitely encountered um, AWS marketing copy and tech documentation. If you're able to share, how 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 does how does it manage to sync that voice at all, if at all? <laughs> I suppose. How do you feel it works? How have you been called in pulled into that situation? I don't even know if I want to uh, talk about this topic because I'm like so inside. I, I have so many mixed emotions. Um, <laughs> the voice thing. Yeah, I, not even the voice. It's the, the fact is, OK, on my team, we're, we're not like all of Amazon is not one giant uh, organization working together. Like mm -hmm. there's a million different small teams, not even related to the AWS team at all, nor nor uh, the Alexa team or others. Right. So very small, but my conflict is that I know that I could write some really good blog articles. I could, I could create an awesome blog that would drive traffic and interest and it would be widely read. I know how to do that because I've done that on my own site. My frustration is that a, I don't have enough bandwidth because I'm like, I've already got so many technical projects that I barely have time to like do other things. Right. But B, I know that in order to get people clicking on things. You have to write about topics that really matter in transparent, open ways. And I've just not been able to crack that code. The only sort of way that I've been successful in writing for our corporate blog was to kind of couch it in terms of like, oh, this was a technical challenge we have. And here's our technical solution. Technology is pretty, pretty safe in terms of like the how to and the technical ease. But uh, once you get to that point, it's kind of like, well, this is already in the documentation, any documentation domain anyway. So why am I like putting this into a blog post? This is just like tech docs with a little bit more narrative, conceptual narrative. So honestly, I sort of put this whole thing on the back burner right now while I try to uh, finish some, some tech projects. But at some point, I would like to return to this corporate blogging sphere and figure it out and do a, you know, a kick-ass job at like just, you know, doing the same kind of blogging that I do on my my regular site so anyway future future placeholder for Tom to revisit <laughs> I feel like this is a topic we could dig into a bit more but we are unfortunately running out of time we only have a couple of minutes left um, I will say the last episode we did had a lot of nice follow-up conversation and I feel like especially this topic I think actually both the topics could have a lot of nice follow-up conversation so do jump into the write the doc slack in the podcast channel and ping any of us to to keep that conversation going because i think actually we could this could be an interesting one we could keep going for a little bit longer but we are going to have to wrap up now so let's start with uh, matt we already at the top of the show mentioned uh, the company you work for but if you have any personal blogs or talks or anything like that coming up in the near future you'd like to to mention now's the time all right. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a great pleasure. Um, so I will actually be speaking at Write the Docs Portland, uh, kind of on a similar subject around how to make a business case for documentation, which is, I think, the topic that no one wants to talk about, but everyone does because, hey, we're part of a business. So, uh, you know, please join me for that. And then also um, very soon we'll be um, K15T will be putting out a resource on writing documentation in Confluence and how it's done. It's probably the, the largest collection of long form writing I have done, and I'm really excited to get that out there. So 
I'll share that somewhere once it's ready, but um, you know, keep an eye out if you're at all curious. And if you're not, um, you can always get on there and critique my grammar and uh, you know, submit some feedback there. So, uh, and please, uh, you know, hit me up on Twitter um, at Reiner Matthew. And that's a, a nice segue because actually um, there's a few events and things coming up in the rest of the community. So, Write the Docs Portland is from May the nineteenth, so actually not very long away. Just after that, uh, a new European date for your calendars. Uh, there's now Write the Docs Vilnius in Lithuania, which is a lovely city, actually. I hope to make make that because it's not very far away from here. Uh, and the CFP is open for talks there. And of course, later in the year, the CFP is currently open for Write the Docs in Prague in September. So uh, if you have some ideas that you've got from this show or from other shows, then jump in and put your CFPs in there. There's also quite a few meetups coming up in the very near future, um, just go to the Write the Docs website and uh, click on the Meetups link. I know, for example, there's one coming up in Berlin. We're getting back again, <laughs> finally. We have a venue, a regular venue, which helps a lot. Uh, and again, you can find previous episodes and the contact details for all of us hosts on uh, podcast.writethedocs.org. Tom or Jared, do you have any final words you want to share before we wrap up? Yeah, I do have one. The, the Write the Docs Australia meetup in particular is having a um, Australia-wide meetup. So we're going to be doing a remote meetup and we're looking for uh, speakers uh, who would like to present topics, either lightning talks or um, more longer um, form topics. So if you uh, are interested in participating, um, uh, get in touch with me or get in touch with Swapnil and um, we can uh, help you get ready. Tom, anything you want to share? Oh. I've got a couple of API documentation workshops I'm giving, one in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, April 6th, uh, another one in Denver in early May. So if you're interested, uh, check my site for more details on that. So I'd rather be writing.com. Excellent. Okay. That was another show. Thanks again, Matt, for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll continue the conversation. I will now leave the final immortal words, as always, over to Jared in the future. Docs or it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs>